So just rem remember which are the elements that Gordon Hanson points out. Tim Kehoe, on the other hand, suggests uh, the following. Suggests that there are inefficient financial institutions. But when he, he talks about inefficient financial institutions, he's not talking about the, the same thing as Gordon Hanson. This is important just to keep in mind. If Gordon Hanson is, 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 is pointing out that poorly functioning credit market means that there's no credit to the private sector. Whereas Kiko, what he says is, that yes, there is, he accepts that there is no credit to the private sector, but what he says is that that's because the bankruptcy law uh, and some other I mean, institutional arrangements are such that the banks are not, do, do not have incentives to lend to the private sector. So he claims that just making these changes could, be, could help a lot. Uh, and then he emphasizes the, the role of the rule of law, which is considered to be insu insufficient. And, and a bad rule of law is not good because then this disincentivates uh, investment in general. That's why it's important. Uh, he also claims that there are rigidities in the labor market, which means that um, uh, it's, it's very costly to hire or fire labor in the, in, in, in the economy, and therefore uh, people decide, uh, just the businessmen decide just not to, to hire or fire uh, in order not to have run, to, to fire people later on in a, in a bad uh, uh, in about the uh, cycle of the economy. Um, and four, he mentions falling public investment and problems in the financial system, which is a little bit related to what Hanson was saying. Um, but he also men mentions this falling public investment. But he mentions that, he says, this has been argued, but I, he doesn't really endorse that view. He, he, he basically sticks to the first three elements. Uh, <coughs> So as you see, th there are now many explanations or alternative explanations. Trade markets, monopolies, um, in informality, China factor, etc. Heckman and, 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 and his students, what they argue is the following, are the following are elements. Excessive regulation in labor markets, for example, so that there is a lot of regulation in those markets. High cost of enforcing contracts and law which again, the reason why that's important is similar to the rule of law point that I made before, in the sense that uh, if there are high costs of enforcing contracts and laws, there are no incentives to invest in some areas because then you might have some uh, uh, legal problems and then it's very hard to, uh, to enforce those contracts. Uh, third, is lack of competition and weak, weak infrastructure. Again, in these sectors that, I, uh, that were identified before, like energy, telecoms, financial services, and other goods. And fourth, poor quality of schooling. And they mentioned the PISA results, where, in which Mexico, I mean, you know about this, in all these PISA results, which is the, this, this standardized exam that the OECD applies you know, to some countries, Mexico is always in, in, in the last in the, in the, in, in the list of countries that, to take these this PISA exams. And they also discuss some other issues, which I'm not going to get into this here. Um, so, um, well, I want to talk a little bit about something, because, ah, uh, this is interesting because Heckman criticizes the Levis hypothesis that I mentioned. He says that doesn't make sense. Levis hypothesis doesn't make sense because I informality is not the consequence, it's not the cause, I'm sorry, it's not the cause of low productivity, as Santiago Levis suggests. He said, uh, what Heckman says is that's the consequence. I mean, it's, people do not go into, into, into informality because there are incentives to go into informality. People go to informality because there are not, not enough jobs in informality, and therefore they have to to resort to this uh, informality market, and they end up earning lower wages in the, in the informal sector um, as a result of not being enough jobs in the in the formal sector. So it's more a consequence rather than, than, than a cause of, of low productivity. So it, they are very critical of Santiago Levy's view, and that's that's why I mentioned this, this is important. This is a view, by the way, which I I take. I have research on this area which uh, sort of supports uh, this, this, this argument. Uh, and uh, what I have done is to compare wages from people with similar skill levels in both the formal and informal sector. And what you observe is uh, that people in the informal sector tend to earn, earn less as, uh, in, in, the, in the informality than the informality, meaning that they are actually uh, 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 having a cost by moving to the, to the informal sector, which is more compatible with the view of uh, a segmentation of the labor market in which people do, cannot get a job in the formal sector and therefore goes to the informal sector as, as a second best option. Um, uh, because if Levis, you were right, you would see um, 
that people were uh, getting like a benefit from moving into the informal sector. For example, like earning the same level of wage of, of, of gross income, but by no, not paying taxes, having a higher level of net income, for example. And that's not happening. So Santiago Levy's view is not compatible with, with what we observe in the in the front. Okay. Then this is this is the view by um, Chiquier and Ramos Francia, which are these guys from Central Bank in Mexico. They have all this diag diagram uh, suggesting what what, the, what, what, what are the, those problems in Mexico. As you can see, that means, for example, um, what they have is um, is a reinforcement process. They start with this inefficient institutional design, lack of competition, and market rigidities. They all lead to weak regulation and supervision, lack of innovation and investment, inefficient allocation of resources, and that leads to suboptimal human and physical infrastructure levels, high input prices, weak public finances. That leads reinforces this, but at the same time, all those produce low com competitiveness, and in the end, that generates insufficient growth, low employment opportunities, and high income inequality. So the problem with this. Uh, I have, in general, I would say this is right. The problem with this is, is like everything is related to a, it's like everything is bad in Mexico, uh, and, and that doesn't. I, think, I don't think that helps a lot uh, to understand what's the, the main problem because it means like it's just like everything is 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 is, is, is not working well in Mexico, and, or everything is related to everything, and that I don't think it helps a lot to understand. To understand. Uh, but then they mention a few a few examples. Which is interesting because, um, and it's interesting because that's the way in which discussion in Mexico takes place. These guys from the central bank say, for example, there are three problems: financial sector, for example, there's lack of competition in the financial sector, and they go into great detail to explain why there is lack of competition in the financial sector. But the, in the end, they say, well, would you know, that might be fine. I mean, that seems like to be a problem, but there is a. That's probably the. An, 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 an outcome, which is, um, what do we prefer? To have a oligopolistic uh, sector in the financial sector with low trade to the private sector, but no risk? I mean, we're not getting into this front like in the US market, with, by lending to a lot of people uh, that actually um, uh, affected the stability and was very risky. Uh, so they say, this is probably bad, but this is the best thing that we can get. Uh, and yeah, I think that, that's part of the problem, because then, uh, Something that they clearly identify as a problem, they sort of discard it when, when they enter into this question, what can we do about that? Because what they say, yeah, that's probably bad, but uh, uh, probably the alternative is worse, which I don't think that's the case. So I will I mean, get back to this later on. And then they, they, they say this second example that they discuss is the inform information and communication technology, and they discuss uh, the problem with Telmex. I don't know if you know about this situation. Carlos Cezanne, which is the richest man in, 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 in the world, basically, is the owner of the, the, uh, the private monopoly in Mexico, which is Telmex, which used to be a public monopoly, was privatized, but was privatized without competition, so basically it was granted a monopoly. Uh, he, now they, they have, there is some competition, but he's like the dominant firm in the sector, um, and uh, it charges a very high rates, and it's very costly, because all this access to this information and communication technology in general in Mexico. So um, they mentioned this case as a problem in which the, co the, the commission in charge of regulating that firm is basically unable to do it because it has been actually um, a, a, a taken over by this uh, firm, which is um, um, uh, basically Cofetel, which is this commission in charge of regulating telecommunication in Mexico, has no enforcement capabilities uh, uh, so far. Uh, not against at least tenants, which is the, the biggest firm in Mexico in, in this area. And the, the third one is, is electricity, which, as I said before, is a public, uh, uh, a public sector monopoly, and it, which is costly again. It's very inefficient in general, and um, and uh, it's very uh, low productivity. And then that increases that. And electricity is important because that's an input for any business in Mexico, for most business in Mexico, and therefore that means that it's costly for all these firms, <coughs> which in, therefore reduces competitiveness in this, in the, for this, all these firms in Mexico. So these are the, the, the products they identify, three very specific sectors. One, they say it's OK. Two others, which uh, they identify as being related to monopolies in Mexico. And, uh, and, and then what they say is the challenge is, uh, a little bit surprisingly, to me at least, is uh, <coughs> they say the challenges and public policies are 
institutional change, uh, and we need, and they say we need institutions supporting transparency and efficiency in public spending. I don't know what do you think about this, but this like doesn't follow from any of this. This is, like, looks more like an ideological thing that they are trying to put into the agenda, which doesn't really that is related to any of these things. The second point, the second uh, challenge in public policies is competition policy, and this one is clearly makes sense because of what they were discussing here, which is um, uh, like strengthen the, the antitrust commission in Mexico, uh, giving the uh, budgetary autonomy and uh, increase penalties and so on, which is something which makes sense given what I just said. Um, so I like this this conclusion. I don't like this one. And they say labor market it needs to increase flexibility, which again doesn't follow from what the, the discussion. This again looks like pretty much like an ideological discussion. Um, so. Um, so now the, the thing is, which one of these, all these uh, diagnostic, di diagnoses are correct or relevant? Um, and if you ask any Mexican economists, they have their own explanation, okay? uh, which is basically a, mi a mix of all what I, what I have just said. I mean, you think about all the light explanations out there, uh, probably with the exception of um, when I have asked this in a group of students or in conferences. Uh, in Mexico, and basically they say any of these even before they even see what they have, other, others have said, except probably the only thing that uh, is not there, that is always appearing in this in these comments, is corruption. Which some is somehow in this discussion about the institutions and all that. But, uh, uh, but even, even though that's important, I don't think that can explain the pattern of growth in Mexico, because it's not that we have become, the society has become more corrupt after 1981. It was probably even more corrupt before that. Uh, um, but anyway, um, so but though, from all these discussions that I have just mentioned, I think there are a few factors which really don't make too much sense to be uh, really important. And what I'm trying to do, as you can see, is trying to take in the discussion that I, I said is now. I'm not yet saying what me, my position is. Just taking all these this, this issues have been put in the table by this, all these economists and seeing which, uh, which, of, which of those arguments make sense. I mean, I mean, which, are, which of those are relevant. So I could get rid of some of these. For example, the China factor. China factor is fine. I mean, it's true, has affected Mexican uh, goods uh, which are competing against Chinese products in the US market. But I if anything, that's important only after 2001, which is when China entered into the WTO. Before that, China was not even into the agenda in Mexico. I mean, China was not basically supporting uh, that much to the US, or to any anywhere else, but, uh, for that matter. So, um, so it's not that important. And Hanson has some interesting analysis on what would have happened if China had not entered into the WTO and so on. And the numbers he gets are really, really, really small. I mean, the, the, the factor, the impact that, that, that China had in Mexico straight is, import, is somewhat important, but it's not that great. Not that relevant at least in terms of GDP. So uh, China has to come in this I mean, this is it's probably important. In some sense, it's good to take that into account, but it's not relevant to explain this three year a three decade period of stagnation that we are trying to, to understand here. I will also discard this informality uh, argument because of what uh, Hegman said. I mean, he it is this paper, which I really buy this argument. That it doesn't make any sense to think that informality affects productivity as, as, a, as a cause, but rather to think that informality is a consequence of low productivity. So, um, and th there are also some results on, on a recent paper which some more or less support this idea that humanity is not that important. Uh, and it's more a, 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 a cause rather than a consequence. A consequence rather than a cause. I don't think labor market rigidity, which is something that some other authors, as you remember, uh, emphasize a lot. Uh, and labor market rigidity, which is something, it's, it's an item in the agenda that the World Bank has been pushing a lot, which is, the point is, uh, workers have uh, many rights and uh, is Hiring them formally is costly, firing them is also costly, and therefore firms do not decide not to create more jobs. So that's basically the main idea. When I'm talking about labor market rigidity, that's what they say. Uh, so what we need to do is to, to make the labor market more flexible. And making it more flexible is, is, is in some ways um, a, like a moving away from full-time jobs to, to, to payments by the hour, uh, to have um, to, to file them with a severance payment, things like that. Which, as you can imagine, is very hard to do uh, this in some sectors. 
I mean, in some sectors, we have unions which are very strong. So those sectors actually do not accept any, 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 any move in, in that direction. That would mean uh, to lose some benefits that they have fight for in, in, in decades. And therefore, that doesn't make too much sense. I mean, that would create an immediate confrontation with these sectors. Um, but other than that, I don't think that's true. I mean, besides the fact that I think it's quite difficult to implement in political terms, it's also very hard to believe that that's important. And let me show you why. Uh, if labor market rigidity were an important argument, one thing you could observe, I think, is that um, uh, during this, during, for example, during a, during a crisis, like a recent one that we went through, uh, if that argument were correct, you should observe like a small contraction in the number of formal jobs in Mexico. And if it's hard to, to create new jobs, when the economy started to recover, you would observe relatively small creation of jobs. Because it's costly. That's what they, that's, that's what they are saying. The argument goes, it's costly to hire, it's costly to fire. So jobs should not react that much to the business cycle. So if the economy goes down, they shouldn't fire that many workers. It's, it's costly to do it. If the economy goes up, they shouldn't create that business shouldn't create that many jobs because it's, it's costly to do that. So it should be like more uh, 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 stable uh, jobs uh, related to the business cycle in general. But what you what you see is not that. Let me just show you a, a little bit. Of, this is formal jobs. These are total formal jobs in Mexico. First of all, see what has happened from 1994 to 2010, which is the latest data. The to total jobs are here. Total formal jobs are. Have, have gone from 10 million to 15 million in this period, this 15 year period. This is since NAFTA was in That means that in this 15 year period, Mexico has created 5 million formal jobs, which is 50% of the total formal jobs that we had in 1994. So we, we have created a lot of jobs. So it is not that creation, the creation of formal jobs is the problem. I mean, we have created a lot of jobs in these past 50 years. This is, this is one thing we should look at. Second, look at the cycles. I mean, it is, doesn't look like it's quite, um, it's quite stable. On the contrary, it looks quite, uh, 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 it's moving a lot with the, with the total activity. And, and, and let me show you that. Uh, here, what, I, what you see here is, the green line over here is economic activity in Mexico. The red line and, and, and this other line over here are um, formal jobs. What you observe, basically, is that they move together. When the economy contracts, total formal jobs contract. When the economy expands, total formal jobs expand. And the stagnation, stagnation in jobs and in the economy. Expansion, expansion in both. So, and, and this is the, the, contra the recent contraction over here. So it is not that the creation of jobs is, is not a problem. So it's the kind of job that we are creating is the problem. So, uh, so that's why I rule out this idea. Look at productivity over here. Productivity is the one uh, similar to what I showed you before, which is stagnant in the past 50 years. So this is just to say that um, uh, the output, output of formal employment correlates uh, highly, which doesn't support this idea of labor market review. So I'm getting rid of many of these explanations, as you can see. I don't believe in the China factor. I don't believe in the, in, in, in the, in the reality labor market. I don't believe in the informality sector explanation, and so on. So the only th the, there are a few things in which I, I, I do believe. But before getting into that, let me show you three other pieces of characteristics of Mexico, growth in Mexican economy in the past few years, uh, which are important in order to understand what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make. What is Mexico's performance relative to the U.S.? Here we have, and we have different measures, uh, depending on which one you want to look at. But this is the, um, the GDP per capita or GDP per worker in Mexico relative to that, the same variable in the U.S. See what happened before. Uh, the, and depending on which variable do you want to use to hire or fire, uh, in order not to have one, to, to fire people later on in a, in a part, uh, uh, in about the uh, cycle of the economy. Um, and four, he mentions falling public investment and problems in the financial system, which is a little bit related to what Hanson was saying. Um, 
but he also men mentions this foreign policy investment. But he mentions that, he says, this has been argued, but I, he doesn't really endorse that view. He, he, he basically sticks to the first three elements. Uh, <coughs> so as you see, th there are now many explanations, or alternative explanations. Trade market problems, and then it's very hard to, to enforce those contracts. Uh, third, this lack of competition and weak, weak infrastructure. Again, in these sectors that, I, uh, that were identified before, like energy, telecoms, financial services, and other goods. And for a poor quality of school. And they mentioned the PISA results, were in which Mexico, if you know about this, in all these PISA results, which is the, this, this standardized exam that the OECD applies you know, to some countries, Mexico is always in, in, in the last in the, in, the, in, in the list of countries that, that take these this PISA exams. As such, that the banks are not, do, do not have incentives to lend to the private sector. So he claims that just making these changes could, be, could help a lot. Uh, and then he emphasizes the, the role of the rule of law, which is considered to be insufficient. And, and a bad rule of law is not good because then this, this incentivates uh, investment in general. That's why it's important. Uh, he also claims that there are rigidities in the labor market, which means that um, uh, it's, it's very costly to hire or fire labor in the, in, in, in the economy, and therefore, uh, people decide, uh, just the businessmen decide just not to get monopolies, um, informality, China factor, etc. Heckman and, 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 and his students, what they argue is the fol are the following are elements. Excessive regulation in labor markets, for example, so that there is a lot of regulation in those markets. High cost of enforcing contracts and law, which again, the reason why that's important is similar to the rule of law point that I made before, in the sense that uh, if there are high costs of enforcing contracts and laws, there are no incentives to invest in some areas because then you might have some uh, uh, legal. So just rem remember which are the elements that Gordon Hanson points out. Tim Key, on the other hand, suggests uh, the following. Suggests that there are inefficient financial institutions. But when he, he talks about inefficient financial institutions, he's not talking about the, the same thing as Gordon Hanson. This is important just to keep in mind. If Gordon Hanson is, is, is pointing out that poorly functioning credit market means that there's no credit to the private sector. Whereas Kiko, what he says is, that yes, there is, he accepts that there's no credit to the private sector, but what he says is that that's because the bankruptcy law uh, and some other I mean, institutional arrangements 